Good morning. Scripture reading this morning will be from Romans 1 through, or Romans 1, 20. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Good morning. Good to see everybody out today. Glad to see our visitors. <clears throat> come to join us this morning. I invite you to come back anytime you're available. So for today's lesson, um, a couple weeks ago, I had a lesson ready. So I texted Ty, seeing he was on for double. And I said, I'll take your Sunday night lesson tomorrow. And that was on Saturday. And I wake up in the morning about, I don't know, eight, and I get in my car and tire pressure says zero. And I go look and there's about a three inch gash in it. And I said, I don't think fix the flat's gonna cover it. So I said, tire you're back on. <laughs> and then when Matt needed replaced today, I was owed a lesson. So here I am today and I'm gonna teach a lesson on excuses for when I gave an excuse for not being able to come as my flat tire. Buses weren't running that day. But, um, so today's lesson, we're going to talk about excuses. I used to have a lot. Um, I used to make a lot of excuses, not to say I still don't, but I'm a little bit better at it. Maybe mom can attest to that. Um, but in Romans 120, it's our Paul writing the Romans there shows us that everything has been revealed to us about God's, even the invisible qualities have been revealed to us necessary to salvation. So we have no excuses to be made. And that's going to be the point of the lesson today is that there are different excuses listed in the parable of the great banquet. I heard this, a lesson of this like in um, West Mason. Yeah, Westchester, Church of Christ, West Mason, same area. Uh, about a month or so ago, and I thought it was a really good topic for everybody to hear. So I decided to write one similar on it and hopefully somebody everybody can take something from it today apply it to their lives and do their best to serve the lord <clears throat> uh, in a better way so before we go to that uh, we'll look at some examples of excuses in the bible and how god has reacted to those so i encourage everybody to follow along <clears throat> uh, in their bibles today first verse we're going to read comes from genesis 3 chapters or genesis 3 verses 11 through 13 And here's probably the most infamous excuse in the Bible that we often address coming from Adam. And starting in verse 11, it says, and he said, um, God speaking to Adam and Eve saying, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So, here we see an example of Adam speaking to God. When God asks Adam, why'd you do the only thing I told you not to do? Adam said, well, it's kind of your fault. You gave me this woman and she tempted me. And there's a, a, a I don't know if academic's the word to say, but some, a guy I like to listen to on podcasts and he covers Genesis in a section. And he goes as far to say that Adam's the, the most important or the biggest person to blame in this instance, because Adam was put in charge of this instance and he was given the responsibility. And when Adam was questioned about why he did the only thing he was not supposed to do, he said, it's not, it's everybody else's fault, but mine. It's God's fault. It's Eve's fault. And for this reason, um, and, and it's the serpent's fault. Eve said it's the serpent's fault. So God um, banished Adam and Eve from paradise and punished Adam to a, a life of work. So another example in the Old Testament of where excuses were made and where God didn't let it slide comes from Judges 6. If you'd like to follow along with that. Here we see um, a dialogue between God and uh, Gideon, starting verse 11. Judges 6, 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Ab Abizurite, where, he, where, he, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. 
when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. This is the angel, my, my mistake. Pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said that? Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us, given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go into the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. The Lord answered, I'll be with you. You will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that is really you talking to me. So Gideon's trying to pull every trick in the book here. And we might think to ourselves, well, he's kind of got a point. How can he expect Gideon, the lowest of all his family and his clan, to take on the biggest foe around? And Gideon, uh, you, you, you see that Gideon says, I can't do this. What, 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 what makes you think I can do this? And God says, well, I'll be with you. And then Gideon's now worried that, well, is this really God? Now that he's making me do something. Let's, let's be sure that it is God. So here's another example of where <clears throat> in a situation that Gideon was questioning, God didn't accept his excuses. So to the point, for the point of today's lesson, we're going to go to uh, Luke chapter 14 and see an example, a parable from Jesus. And the point of the, this parable I'm going to bring up today is that Jesus lists three excuses that the people in the parable gave to <clears throat> gave in the lesson. And one thing we've learned, you'll learn, and we have learned from a study of the Bible is that things in the Bible aren't arbitrarily put there. Everything there is put for a reason. So these three examples given in this parable are excuses that we might give in our own lives so that apply to us just the same. So in Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 15, When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who leave the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was a great ban was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come for everything now is ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. They first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. So let's break this down for a second. So we have a wedding and people are being invited to the wedding. So if we break it down, the wedding is when Jesus died on the cross, he came down from heaven, took the form of the man and died <clears throat> so that the new covenant will be brought um, to earth and Everybody can be saved for the remission of sins under the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And everybody was invited to that. <clears throat> and the wedding guest, like I said, is everybody. So the excuses are from the foolish men who turned down this invitation, or it could be us today, who might turn down the invitation still extended to us in the same fashion, and the country lanes of the downtrodden of life. So let's break each of these down. So the first thing is work. So the first guy said, or whatever verse that is, 18, I just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. So many times, including me today, we say, well, so this is, I'm, I'm going to organize all these in reference to doing God's will or what we know is morally right in the eyes of God. We say, I have work. I can't do this for this reason relating to work. So, Matthew 6, 19 through 21. <clears throat> I'll read that from the slide. The reason this one's relating to work is because, so we'll, we'll move on to the oxen one next, but 
he's saying, I just bought this field. And for anybody who's ever done farm work or knows how farm work happens, if you don't plant your seed by a certain time, you're done. You got to get the seed in before a certain time frame, or you won't be able to harvest your crops by winter. So he's saying, I can't come to your wedding. I got work to do. Makes sense, doesn't it? But is that work really worth opposed to going to the wedding? That's what we're going to find out. So in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where th thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for your treasure is there your heart will be also <clears throat> in that verse we see that wedding that we've been invited to which is the reward in heaven in the end is going to outweigh <clears throat> any um work that we might find ourselves doing and oftentimes we can justify not because we know if a man doesn't work neither shall he eat but in this instance, we have to trust that God will provide. And, and, and we can't make, we, can, we, we Mary Lou today mentioned in Bible class, you can justify anything in your own mind. So you might think, well, I really can't do that because I got to work. Do you really have to work? Or is that just what you have your mind set to in the moment? In Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21, this, uh, this excuse has really been resonating with me lately because I'm in that point of my education and career where um, everybody's finding jobs. I just spent three hours last week sending out letters and stuff. And <clears throat> there's a phrase in my school that people are, well, I guess you just call it in law school, call it selling your soul. And that is, <laughs> there's not much more you can say around that, but it means, are you willing to sign up for a big firm and make a lot of money, but work 90 hours a week? And it's saying, well, you, people justify in their mind. I'm not. What, I'm not saying this is morally wrong, but myself, I try to steer clear of it. Um, are you willing to sacrifice five years of your life to make a lot of money, and then afterwards, then you can say, "Well, then I'll then I'll work for God." What happens if you don't live through those five years, or after those five years, you say, "Well, five more years." It's just a chain. It's a cycle. So <clears throat> that's an instance in my life where I could say. Well, I'll just work these five years and then I can take that money or whatever and give it to God. But you got to ask yourself, God gave you those five years. Did you waste them? We're going to have to be able to give account for that in the end. So along with that, Jesus talks about that in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Uh, Luke chapter 12. Someone in the crowd said to him, this is somebody talking to Jesus. Teacher, tell me my... Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man who, appointed, man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against the kind of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them the parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will give what you have to prepare for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves and is not rich towards God. So this is exactly that example. And you know, I underline, he says, I'll say to myself. Who says, I'm going to do this in five years and then say to myself, he knows he feels guilty. I need to justify this in my own mind. I'll tear down these barns. And then later on, when it pays off, I'll say, hey, we did good work. Let's chill out now. We did, we did a good job. But Jesus says here, this night, the, you, you don't have five years. You wasted your time chasing earthly things and material possessions. And that time God granted you has now been wasted. And you're going to answer for that tonight. So in re reaching that back around to the work, um, don't let work be the excuse that keeps you um, from <clears throat> building a relationship with God or following the Lord's will. So the next example related to this example is money slash opportunity. So you might think buying a field, buying oxen, what's the difference? 
Well, Jesus wouldn't have put the two things if they weren't different. So the difference is you might be able to justify and say, well, I bought the field. I need to plant the seed or it's going to go to waste and it's work I have to do. But this guy says, I just bought five ox, which back then he's saying, I just bought five tractors. I just bought five, whatever. One of the most valuable things in the day, I bought five of them and I got to go make sure they work because I don't know yet. So can we let money be our excuse or maybe even opportunity to get money if it's not money yet um, to keep us from doing the Lord's will? So if we turn to Ecclesiastes chapter five, Verses 10 through 12, it says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefits are they to their owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. I have seen a grievous, a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. So here we see an example where Solomon, the man who did everything and was the wisest man to ever live, said, if you think that once I get the money, once I work and do whatever I can to get this money, I can use it for God. Solomon's telling us here that once you get that money, the lust for money never goes away. You won't be able to sleep. You'll chase it till you're dead. And then again, there goes your time. We all have limited time on this earth. And if we waste it, we can say the excuse, God, I was getting this money. I was getting it and I was going to build you a new church. I was going to give it to the poor, but you, I died before I got the chance to. So don't let money be the excuse in between. Here, here's a funny little story that I, that I found. Um, a little small, but I can read it. So it's a story about the monkeys. I said, look to the monkeys. Monkey hunters use a box with an opening at the top big enough for the monkey to slide its hand in. Inside the box are nuts. The monkey grabs the nuts and now its hand becomes a fist. The monkey tries to get its hand out of the opening and the opening is big enough for the hand to slide in, but too small for its fist to come out. Now the monkey has a choice. Either let go of the nuts and be free forever or hang on to the nuts and get caught. Guess what the monkey picks every time? You guessed it. He hangs onto the nuts and gets caught. So you got an example of monkeys. They, they stick their hand in there. This is, this is a real thing. It's how monkey hunters catch monkeys and they grab the nuts and they can't get their hand out of the box because it won't fit through. And they think, well, if you drop the nut, you can get out. But in that monkey's brain, he says, if I drop the nut, I lose the nut. Not worth it. So I can, it's a silly example, but it can happen to us. We think I have this money. I, I can't let it go. But maybe grabbing onto that money is going to be the thing that ends up getting us caught. If we just let go of the money, if that monkey, if that monkey holds on to the nut, he ends up getting caught and getting killed. And it just negates the very purpose of grabbing the nut in the first place, to eat, to live. But we can have the same things happen to us. If we chase money and let that be our excuse to keep us between us and God, it will be the downfall of us. And there will be no reason in the end. Like I said, you can say, look at all this good I can do with my, with my money. I'm not saying having money is inherently bad. But the chase of money and using money as an excuse to keep you between you and God can end up leaving you like this monkey. So the last thing in this parable comes from uh, the same thing in Luke. And the guy says, I just got married, so I can't come. And one thing the guy in Westchester brought up that I never realized is that all the other guys says, all the other, the other two guys said, I got a field, so please excuse me. I have oxen so please excuse me this guy says i got married i'm not going to be there so fill my spot he doesn't even care so <clears throat> how can this relate to us today well um i'm not here to say family relationships are very important but if your family is the one causing you to stumble and keep you between you and god then what does jesus say about that in matthew chapter 10 matthew chapter 10 verses 34 Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. 
I do not bring peace but a sword, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life, for my sake, will find it. So there's countless verses in the Bible that tell you how important family relationships are and <clears throat> taking care of your family. And I'm not here to be, this isn't a divorce lawyer ad. I'm not here to say, leave your wife because I'm trying to make money. No. I'm here to point out that there are instances in life, and I've seen it working in family decisions just in my job, where people's family can be their downfall. They do think the, the person, the person who would normally do something that's morally right loses their reason and themselves in the end because their family brings them down. Now, it could be anybody. I'm not saying lose your family, but if your family member or somebody or a friend or somebody really close to you is the thing that's causing you to stumble, you need to address that in your life. At first, Samuel will turn to an Old Testament example of where um, Samuel was, uh, his downfall was his family. And Samuel is one of the people that we know, one of the most important characters of the Old Testament. He set up the kingdom of Israel, but he, along with many other people in the Bible, stumbled on his kids. And 1 Samuel 8, it says, when Samuel grew old, he appointed sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his secondborn was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint, a king to, now appoint a king to lead us, such that all the other nations have. Um, but when they asked, well, when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. So Samuel, one of the most prominent um, prophets in the Old Testament, his kids led to the downfall of Israel because Samuel appointed his kids who weren't fit to rule and Israel wouldn't take that. They said, you have appointed these people. They don't follow your lead. And now we want a king. And Samuel knew that was not the system God had set up to lead them. So Samuel even let, it says, you're old. Your sons do not follow your ways. And now appoint a king to lead. So there's just an example of many in the Bible where Samuel was brought down by his kids. So like I said, I'm not here to say tear apart your family, but if you in your own personal life, you examine yourself, have people in your life that are anchors to yourself and you cause an excuse. You say, well, they're, you know, how many times you heard that? They're family. What are you going to do? Well, if that family is leading to yourself, between, keeping you from yourself in heaven, Jesus said, you need to pick the right choice in the end. So that's the end of the excuse portion of this. So in conclusion, I guess I should say, for today's lesson, don't let any of these things be the excuse to keep you between you and God. Um, Luke chapter 6, 24 through 23 through 24 says, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because you're great, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how the ancestors treated the prophets. So we might think being here today, I have let all these things go. I don't, I don't have any money. My family hates me, all these things because of my faith, because I choose to do what's right in God. But this verse tells us that um, our reward is in heaven. That's what we need to look forward to in the end. I chose this picture because we have descriptions in the Bible about what heaven looks like, but I like to just imagine the most, I don't know, beautiful picture you can think of. That's what I think of on that. So that's the picture that I thought looked great. You can pick your own picture in your mind, but just it's just eternal bliss. That's the reward that is between, that we can't let separate us, any of the things I listed today from that. So if anybody today has not obeyed the gospel and you'd like to do so, I'll ask you to come up front today and we'll take care of that. Or if anybody needs the prayers of the congregation, you can also have a seat up front of the standing invitation song.